So the work is what's up first today. We'll go over these real quick and try to make sure that they're on the screen for you so you can actually see what is going on. All right. So here we go. Number one, identify the verb and its mood in the sentence below. I'm not going to read the sentence to you, but I will tell you it is indicative. Wow. Indicative. So you should have circled the very first thing or at least written it down on your paper. Second one is proofread the sentence below and then rewrite the corrected sentence. Changes you should make is mother should be capitalized. Mother should be capitalized. Um, it's I-T apostrophe S because it is it is rather than it's uh, the possessive pronoun. Um, so we've done mother, uh, we've done it's. Uh, it's too hot, T-O-O, -O, hot, instead of too hot. It is uh, increasingly hot. It is more than hot enough. So it is too hot to lie instead of lay. It should be lie by the fire. Lie by the campfire tonight. So again, changes, capital M, it, apostrophe S, T-O-O, -O, lie. And then, you know, probably should be a period at the end of the sentence. I mean, it is a sentence, right? Uh, number three is which of the following could abate trick question because there's more than one answer. Uh, a is correct. Your feelings can abate. Storms can also abate. Those are two different things that you can have. Abate. Number four says use either commas or parentheses or dashes where needed below. Just use commas. Let's not get crazy here. There should be a comma after siblings. There should be a comma after intense because intense series are, it's a short series of adjectives and then after child uh, because you're offsetting an adjective clause there all right so we've got that and then the last one is choose the antonym of course antonym is opposite antonym is opposite looking for the opposite of bizarre bizarre is weird customary would be the opposite of bizarre so that would be the correct antonym so there's your bell work uh, a couple of notes up here at the very top one uh, make sure you're doing your A3K. Be a good thing to do. It's one of your two, well, I guess three assignments for this week. Um, two of them are computer-based. A3K is one of them. Also, no red ink is the other thing that is computer-based. If you haven't signed up for no red ink yet, and many of you haven't, at this point in time, I've got nine people who are working on this week's assignment, which is weird because it feels like I've got somewhere around 76 students, so it would be good if some of the rest of you signed in. Thanks, I appreciate your assistance. Um, so we've got that, get more people coming in at this point in time. Hey, those of you who are typing in the chat right now, red ink, what's that? I've never heard of it. Go back and read the posts, read all the posts in Edmodo. There's lots of things for you to read, lots of things for you to pay attention to. Also, poem teleconferences, if you want to request one, you may just uh, email me or send me a message through Edmodo and say, I need to have a teleconference. And then I can be like, oh, okay, cool. Well, then I guess we should do something about that. Uh, I'm going to stop that for a second. I'm going to share some information because we now need to talk about poems. Our poems today are from a poet named Emily Dickinson, American poet, female poet. It's two in a row, I think. Um, Dickinson was alive in the 1800s. Um, she has written a lot of poems. This is the point where if we we're actually in the classroom as opposed to being stranded outside of school, uh, at this point I would take her giant book of poetry, and I know it looks like it's as big as my head, but really it's only a little bit bigger than my ear, which I know that's still big, you know. Um, or giant book of poetry, and I would drop it onto a desk for it to make a satisfying thud. I don't have anything here. There, satisfying thud on the desk, and that way everybody would be startled and go, oh my goodness, oh, this is a, this is a big book of poetry. So we're going to read uh, two different poems by her today. Uh, this first one you may have actually heard in like a, uh, like a commercial. I feel like I've actually been in, you know, I'm trying not to watch a whole lot of TV because there are commercials on TV, but I, I feel like I've heard this in a commercial recently, this, this particular poem. So um, again, those of you who are asking me questions still about no red ink, 
go to Edmodo. Don't do it right now. Do this right now. We're going to read poems. I'm pointing like you can see the poem, but I know on the video later, people will be able to see the poem. We're going to read the poem, go through the poem, then we're going to read through a second poem, and then we'll keep moving. So uh, don't worry about no red ink, red ink yet. Worry about that in, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes. That seems like a fair amount of time. Okay, what's going on? I'm trying to let everybody in, and it's just not happening. Well, we're doing the best we can, right? Great. Let's see. There they are. Okay. So, uh, first things first, as usual, we're going to read the poem. I will try to read it for you. We'll see how this goes. Again, the poet is Emily Dickinson. She did not actually title her poems, but most of her poems are actually known by the first line. So it kind of functions as both first line and title. So this first one, we'll call it, If I Can Stop One Heart From Breaking. If I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life the aching, or cool one pain, or help one fainting robin unto his nest again, I shall not live in vain. All right. So there's the first read. Second time? Great. We'll do it again. <clears throat> if I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life the aching, or cool one pain, or help one fainting robin unto his nest again, I shall not live in vain. All right. So a couple of things for us to take away at the very beginning here. Um, if you think back over the poems that we've read over the last few days, Everything we've done so far has been free verse. Everything we've done so far has been free verse. We have not had any that have had any rhythm, any rhyme, any meter to them. Everything that we've done so far has really been focused on kind of more free verse and trying to be descriptive. Today, a little bit different, a little bit different. So let's see. Um, we actually do have, as Kang points out, we do have a rhyme scheme in this particular poem. So rhyme scheme is a little bit different than rhyme. Rhyme is the first thing that we need to talk about though. So let's just talk about the idea of rhyme. So as we're looking at this poem, one of the things that we wanna to try to identify is how things rhyme. So we have breaking and aching. So those two are clearly rhyming. In addition to breaking and aching, um, well, we do have this word vain that actually repeats a couple of places. Uh, you could, as I pronounced it the second time, you could say vain and again does rhyme. You could also say pain rhymes. And then in addition to that, we, we could maybe make the argument that we also have a half rhyme that is appearing in here. Rob, in maybe if you, if you made these G's really soft or even silent G's. So if I could stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I could ease one life the aching, or cool one pain, or help one fainting robin unto his nest again, I shall not live in vain. So it certainly is possible that we could even say we do have a consistent rhyme where maybe, maybe this is a, 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 and then we have a b, 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 b potentially. So if we're looking at rhyme scheme, th there's an argument to be made for this. Uh, there's also an argument to be made that maybe this A is not actually working at all. We could be actually just looking at a half rhyme here uh, with Robin aching Robin. Eh, it's not great, but you could make an argument. Um, so Ainsley asks, is the Robin a slant rhyme? A slant rhyme? That's a fun poetic term that I don't even know what that would mean. That, sound, that sounds fun. So uh, I see what you're saying. You guys are saying Robin and again. So the other option, yes, you're correct. We could actually uh, slang perhaps, yeah, maybe. Um, so we could actually say that there is a rhyme here between Robin and again. Rob, N again, so that one could work as well. Hey, uh, whoever's decided to go ahead and start uh, annotating, get out, clear your screen. I'll let you know if I need your help. Until that moment. 
and correct yourself. Thanks for your assistance. Uh, so looking at what we've got on the screen right now, I mean, there are some different ways for us to walk through this. Again, those of you who have decided I want to get involved and I want to start marking up the screen, you can have your own teleconference later. Zoom is free for 40 minutes. You can invite everybody in and you can annotate your own poems. Huh, this one's mine. Okay. So looking at everything that we've got on the screen right now, we definitely do have rhyme scheme. We definitely do have uh, ways to look at the rhyme scheme and say that, you know, realistically, there's even, there's room for us to argue. I mean, we can argue about meaning of poem over and over and over again. We can always argue about meaning of poem. But at the same time, we can also find a way to find some type of argument about really what the poet's intent. Now, here's one trick about Emily Dickinson. She wrote a ton of poems, a ton of poems. She didn't have an actual book of poetry published until um, after her death. She dies in 1886. Four years later, uh, as at her death, they find all of these poems. And by all of these poems, I mean all of these poems. And so they actually bind them together. And she had even bound them together, hand sewn many of them together herself. She binds them together and then they find all of them and they start to publish them. Publish slowly but surely, but then ultimately they're all put together. All right, so let's keep, uh, let's keep going here. See if I can actually clear the screen now, that would be helpful. All right, but let's go back and talk about what exactly she is discussing here. If I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. Well, first, I guess the question is, who is speaking? Who is speaking? So let's bring up the chat and see what people say. Emily, her, Emily Dickinson, Emily, 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 her, the author, all of those are correct. Uh, this does seem to be Emily actually speaking in her own voice. Again, we do have for the first person pronoun, so it does lead you to believe that this is her actually talking. So well played on that front. Um, when she says, if I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. Is she talking about herself or is she talking about somebody else? If you actually read the entirety of the poem, it actually kind of looks like perhaps she's talking about somebody else. It's, it certainly is possible that she's talking about other people and trying to help them from having a broken heart. Somebody just said, it's kind of like a little pep talk. I think that was Kang who said that. That's not bad. Um, this is a poem that does seem to kind of reach out to the reader and say, look, one of the things that we could try to do is try to keep people from having to go through the misery of heartbreak. And if you can stop that from happening, then I shall not live in vain. Certainly it's possible you could read this, these first two lines and say, hey, you know, maybe, maybe what she's talking about is um, if she can stop one heart from breaking, if she can find somebody who she can be like, oh, you know what, you and me together, yay, we good. She shall not live in vain. So maybe, maybe that's the way that she's looking at this. Certainly it's possible that that might be an approach that she is taking. Um, if I can ease one life the aching or cool one pain or help one fainting robin unto his nest again, I shall not live in vain. So she could be talking about somebody else. In the alternative, she could be talking about herself. She could be talking about whether or not she can actually protect herself. Maybe if she can avoid heartbreak, this will be a success for her. So there's a couple of different ways for us to examine this poem. There's a couple of different ways that you can read this poem. And it, I guess it depends on whether or not you are, um, you know, uh, a, an optimist or a pessimist. Maybe you're okay with the idea of heartbreak because it at least means that you've gone through the the connecting with somebody to actually have your heart broken. Or maybe this is, I'm going to go ahead and build that wall so I don't have to deal with anybody else coming in and giving me a chance that I could actually get hurt. So a couple of different ways to examine this poem. Um, ultimately, uh, Dickinson, she, she tended to uh, not isolate herself wouldn't say that she was a, a total recluse, but 
but she was not active. She did not go out and hang out with a whole lot of people. She would write letters and include poems in her letters, but, but realistically, this may be somebody who's feeling a little bit lonely as we're looking at the poem, perhaps. All right, so let's move on to a second one. And this one, this one is a little bit more, well, I think this one gives us a different challenge to deal with. Let me uh, read through it a couple of times real fast. I stepped from plank to plank, so slow and cautiously. The stars about my head I felt, about my feet the sea. I knew not, but the next would be my final inch. This gave me that precarious gait some call experience. Again, second time, those of you who are already thinking, I have no idea what some of these words mean. Uh, if you've got a phone sitting next to you, then you might have an opportunity to start looking up these words and make sure that you understand. So I stepped from plank to plank, so slow and cautiously. The stars about my head I felt, about my feet the sea. I knew not, but the next would be my final inch. This gave me that precarious gait some call experience. Okay. Um, Anthony just asked, hey, why is I stepped in all caps? Uh, if we actually scroll back up, let me go back here. You can see the first two, the first two words of this one are in all caps. And the first two words of this poem as well are in all caps. Uh, it's just a stylistic choice in terms of what we're actually seeing. Um, uh, again, uh, many, if not maybe every single poem that Emily Dickinson wrote, uh, the original handwritten versions, you can probably find screen caps of all of them online. So if you want to see what her handwriting looks like, as well as how she wrote and intended the poems, she was very clever. She wrote them and made them look like you see on the pager, but then even beyond that, sometimes she would write them vertically. She would do things all kinds of very clever and creative ways. So uh, there is certainly a reason to go out and search out what she says. So the first thing that jumps out is, as it usually does, people start going, wait, Plank? Is this a doctor, uh, doctor? <laughs> Dr. Hook is a musician, not the same guy. Is this a Captain Hook situation? <laughs> is this a Captain Hook situation? Uh, as soon as somebody's walking the plank, you're like, oh, pirates are involved. I'm very excited. It's not pirates. It's not pirates. It does seem like this is going to be a pirate, pirate tale, but alas, it's not. Um, how can we possibly tell that this is not a pirate tale? How can we possibly tell? Again, as we're looking at the poem, think about this. And, and you know, much of this does lend itself to this idea of pirates. Um, so the fact that we have plank to plank, and you're walking slow, about my feet, the sea, um, precarious gait, right? I, uh, final inch, so maybe about to walk off the edge of the plank. So that could be very dangerous. That could be very, very dangerous. Um, so yeah, it certainly lends itself to going, wait a second, this seems to be a poem about, uh, about having to walk the plank and falling into the sea. However, I, I think it's a little bit different. We'll get to that in a second. Let's talk about the words precarious gait. Let's talk about the words precarious gait. What what does precarious mean? What does precarious mean? Surely somebody has opened up their cell phone since they're now here and you could, uh, you could actually use your cell phone. Jai says clueless. I, I kind of like clueless. I'm not sure that's entirely, entirely accurate. Oh, Serenity, your phone's taken away already. It's been like three days. Oh boy. Not securely held in position, uncertain. So precarious is uncertain. All right, my handwriting is not so good. That says uncertain, kind of. How about gait? Anybody here uh, ride horses? Anybody in gait, you know, gates, those are the things that the horses jump over. Is that this? Definitely not this. Definitely not this. Uh, gait, it looks like everybody has found the exact same Google definition, a person's manner of walking. So, 
So precarious, so uncertain steps, uncertain steps. So somewhat hesitant walking, somewhat hesitant style of walking. So that's what we see here. So let's talk about uh, these particular lines. Let's change color real quick, actually. Let's talk about these particular lines. He says, trying to write in blue. The stars about my head I felt, about my feet the sea. What uh, what are we talking about? So there's a uh, an idea that uh, that Aiden has put forward that perhaps perhaps this is somebody who is uh, fearful of death. I think that's accurate. I think that's accurate. I think there's a good way for us to interpret this. Is uh is this night or day? Let's go to the easier edge of this. Let's go to the easier edge of this. Is this night or day? This is night. Stars about my head, I felt. All right. So at nighttime, if the stars are above your head, that means little white dots that are on a black background. I'm going to try my best here. It's not great. It's not bad. I could do better, I'm sure. All right, so we have that, and now I'm going to draw a uh, plank. I'm going to draw it like it's a pirate plank, even though I think we've agreed that it doesn't seem to be a pirate plank. But I'll go ahead and do it like that. That's pretty fun and exciting. Um, what would you see underneath? About my feet, the sea. So what should I draw to actually show the underneath? Ah, there we go. That's exactly what I wanted to see. Stark jumps in here and he goes, hey, well, it should still be stars. Yeah, because of the reflection off of the water. Usually we would draw a nice shiny blue water, but alas, because it's nighttime, the water is gonna look not shiny and blue. Instead, it's going to mimic the exact same color of the sky above it. And so it's going to be black and it will probably also be reflecting those particular lights of the sky. So. So now we've got somebody walking from plank to plank, slow and cautiously with a precarious gait with stars over their head and feet that were just above the seat. Now, the reason that we don't think, or the reason that I don't think that this is a pirate tale is the fact that we have a plank. Come on, Penn. We have a plank. Ha ha ha. Oh, you turned it off. Let's try it again. Plank to plank. Pirate ships really only have one plank. So it would be really crazy if you managed to go from plank to plank. I mean, unless there were two pirate ships that were really close to one another, and then that could be a really exciting action movie. Note to self, right pirate ship jumping from plank to plank action movie. I'll remember that later. Uh, Nevea suggests perhaps instead, perhaps instead we're actually talking about a dock, perhaps instead, we are not talking about um, a, a plank on a pirate ship, but instead we're talking about a dock. So that means I need to change my pen color and try to draw something that looks a little bit more like a dock. Oh boy, this is not good. Uh, let's see. Let's say this is a pier that's holding up the dock, and then we have another pier that's back here that's holding up the dock. And now when we say plank to plank, we need this to look a little bit more like this. Happy little lines, happy little lines. Uh, so yeah, now we've got a dock. And so as she's stepping plank to plank, she's actually stepping on the different planks that actually make up the dock. So as we have things that are, that are, um, that are making their way across, uh, She's making her way across these planks, one after another after another. But it's night, so she doesn't know where the end of this dock is. So she is at risk of falling directly into the sea with every single step. So I knew not, but the next would be my final inch. So there certainly is a possibility that any single step could be that step that allows her to fall off of the dock into the water. Wait a second. Is this whole thing a metaphor? 
Is this whole thing a metaphor? Do we have a metaphor here? Is that what's happening? Is this a fun extended metaphor? Extended metaphor would be a metaphor that actually stands the entire length of the poem. Is this an extended metaphor? Oh, look, people are just saying yes. Really? You know what my follow-up question is. Then what is it a metaphor for? Uh, Aiden jumps in and says, hey, it's her life. It's her life. Her life is the plank. So as she is walking along this dock, as she is walking along above the water, she has the risk of the end of her life that could be in front of her at any single moment. And she just hasn't gotten all the way there yet. I like this one. This poem's not too bad. I think I'm a fan. All right. So uh, Nevea suggests maybe it's her sanity. Maybe because she is lonely, she is like, oh, I hate this. It, it certainly could be reflective of uh, her loneliness and maybe her distrust. And that also would go back to the previous poem. If I could stop one heart from breaking, maybe she is being slow and cautious because she also wants to protect herself and make sure that she doesn't end up being hurt at any point in time. So it could be reflective of that. I think there are certainly some different ways that we could look at this. Uh, she never knows when she's going to die. She's being careful and walking her step through life because of danger. And so certainly that does go exactly to this last line of the poem, Dr. Schwartz, with the suggestion that she is being super careful. And so perhaps she's actually had her heart broken before. And so now the experience of having her heart broken is what is allowing her to now be more cautious and not put herself at risk. So yeah, two stanzas. She's the speaker again. Her audience is whoever the reader is in this particular. Um, this, this seems to be a poem that is giving some kind of advice about how to live. So she's, she's not saying rush headlong through life with reckless abandon. She's not saying that at all, that it seems as though just step by step, maybe those very first steps as you first step off the shore and onto the dock, you can actually run a little bit because you know the dock's probably gonna be fairly long. You got some, you've got some runway, but as you get down here to inch by inch by inch, as you've gotten older, as you've gone through the experience, now you're starting to slow things down and be a little bit more slow, a little bit more cautious. So, we see all of these different elements in this particular poem. Again, big takeaways from this poem. You don't have to write as much as George L. Lyon does to be able to actually have something that's really good. You can see in this particular poem, we've got two fairly short stanzas, two four-line stanzas. Um, no rhyme scheme in this one. No rhymes for us at all in this one. No internal rhyme, no endline rhyme, no rhythm to this particular poem either. Those of you who are starting to think about rhyming, those of you who are starting to think about the rhythm of what you're writing, um, be careful because generally speaking, when we're talking about rhyme, one of the things that we're also going to need to focus on is making sure that there's a meter that helps accentuate those rhymes. Meter is the rhythm of the poem. ba bum ba bum ba bum Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. and making sure that we have that, that consistent kind of beat because it allows your reader to understand where exactly they should be looking for those rhymes. So uh, if we actually go back to the prior poem, which I hate to do because look at this drawing. I mean, this, this is spectacular. On an iPad with this weird smart pen, I mean, this, this is pretty good. And considering, I mean, I, I'm going to pat myself on the back. Maybe you guys aren't as proud of me, but I definitely am proud. So in your face. All right, we cleared it. Let's go back to this. Uh, talking about rhyme scheme. One other thing to be cautious about, especially as you're working on your own poems. If I can stop one heart from breaking, if I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life, the aching or cool one pain. Meter's not perfect here. I mean, if we were looking for exact same beats over and over again, I don't think we exactly have that, but I think if you look at these two lines, I think, I think we are pretty, pretty close. We are pretty, pretty close, if not exact on those two lines. Uh, this one and this one perhaps don't match up. Perhaps don't match up as well. Um, 
but there's something for you to keep in mind something for you to keep in mind as you're working on stuff again i'm not looking for you to mimic george l lion and that i need three long stanzas again we got a single stanza here in this emily dickinson poem uh a mere seven lines it's really not that heavy but she's done some creative stuff here in terms of potential rhyme schemes that show up and you can actually try to put these together in several different ways so that's emily dickinson Two short poems, one somewhat short class. All right, uh, if you got questions, get at me on Edmodo. Um, the question, uh, Cossum is checking in to say, wait, 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 who, what is the website we're supposed to go to? What's the website? Uh, it's called No Red Ink, N-O-R-E-D-I-N-K, but there's a class code that I have sent to you previously through Edmodo. Please make sure that you have the class code. Please make sure that you have the class code and that you log in. Uh, there is an assignment waiting for you there. Also, A3K, get that done. Those of you who are already done, and there are a lot of you who are already done, boom, walking away, no big deal. Uh, one, yay, go you. Uh, two, thank you. Three, everybody else, get on board. Let's go, enough of that. Um, I will go back and check the post and make sure that the class code is there. Also, the very first email that you got from uh, Meyer with all of the long list of stuff for this week it was definitely in that message as well. All right. Um, anything else? Does it have to be with the thought question? Yes, Jackson. Two, two, set, two, two steps, one five step. Make sure that you do those three. Make sure you do those three. Um, all right, I guess that's pretty much it. Uh, again, if you got questions, if you wanna set up a teleconference to talk about your poem, uh, glad to do that. Whatever you guys need, we will try to take care of things. In the meantime, um, make sure that you're doing your assignments. Uh, be good to each other, be good to your family, be good to yourself. We'll see you tomorrow for more big fun. All right, talk to you.